Okay, so you're going to explain to me some issues with the exponential sheaf sequence. More like complain than explain. Um, just, you know, report on difficulties that I have trying to get the calculations to fit together. The long exact, long exact, what is it called? Long exact cohomology sequence of the exponential sheaf sequence for. Uh, I mean, I guess you could do this what for any protective variety or something like that. Uh, anyway, we're doing it for yeah. an abelian. We're we're doing it for an abelian variety, and we're doing it for probably a two-dimensional abelian variety. Okay, and. Um, So yeah, so we're gonna have uh, where this is this is some very famous uh, thing that among algebraic geometers, some sheaf cohomology thing that they do. Um, yeah, so that, so they have a they have a short exact sequence of sheaves, and uh, uh, but but I guess you get these sheep once you settle on the once you settle on the projective variety or complex manifold or something like that um, then you get these sheaves so there's the discrete integers so that's a a sheaf. And there's the, I've, I've totally forgotten how to, how to say the terminology. I, I want to say it's like the additive group, but with, you know, holomorphic coefficients. How do you say that? Um, That's fine. I think people call it like the structure sheaf or something. It's like a super fundamental sheaf. Okay, but it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably, but I just want to say it in a lowbrow way. Uh, it's the sheaf. It's the sheaf of, of holomorphic, holomorphic sheaf of holomorphic functions with continue with with coefficients in the additive group or something like that. With coefficients in, yeah, in complex number. Uh, and 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 the. These are these are sheets of a being group, so the being group structure is the addition. Yes. And then there's the, uh, well, so, so we already had an, an, an inclusion of that discrete integers into that additive thing. So, right, maybe I should have said, right, for the low breath thing for the integers, I should have been saying something like the sheaf of locally constant, is that right what I say? So sheaf of locally constant. Uh, integer valued functions, yep. Integer valued functions, okay. And, um, and then you could just take the, you know, so, so that the, the, so there's an obvious yeah. inclusion. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's enough to determine it. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's an obvious inclusion there. And, you know, always it's called the exponential sheaf sequence because it's based on, you know, exponentiation and the, the way that the integers are the kernel of exponentiation classically, but in this context too. But you could say it more explicitly what this quotient sheaf is. It's the sheaf of holomorphic functions valued in C, in complex numbers with the origin removed, which is kind of like the multiplicative group. And the, the, the abelian group operation, there is multiplication. So yeah. And um, so, uh, so the example, well, so like I said, we, one of the examples we could do this is, is with uh, an abelian variety, let's say an abelian surface, two complex two-dimensional abelian surface, abelian mm -hmm. variety. Yep. And, um, and there's a couple of possibilities depending on how generic the abelian surface is. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I said at a certain point, seems like I've forgotten everything, but at, at a certain point, you and I were 
thinking fairly concretely about like the neuron severi group of these abelian surfaces, which is like the what the dis, the group of components of the Picard group of the uh, abelian surface. So. Uh, right, and so, and so in particular cases, we saw that the neuron severi group was uh, free abelian group of rank four. But then there were more allegedly more generic cases where it's just a free abelian group of rank one. Yep. And for the ones where it's rank four, I think, you know, it seems really easy to just completely fill out what the whole long exact cohomology sequence of this exponential sheaf sequence is gonna look like. But then when I try to do it for the more allegedly more generic case where the neuron severity rank is one, I just get, get confused. I'll probably just make some stupid mistake and um, you might be able to immediately clear up the mistake or as you suggested, maybe we can just think about it and go home for homework but I, I, right the, the the good result would be if i could if i could can, can communicate to you what it is that i'm confused about the bad re bad result would be if i can't even see what i was confused about <laughs> um so uh yeah so so we identified right first we have first we have the the, the short exact sequence of sheaves and you know, so we arrange those in left, right, left, middle, and right columns, and um, and then the long exact cohomology sequence just you know comes from that, and so we get these. <laughs> We're going to arrange it in columns, and uh, yep. so in 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 the whole first column is going to be the ordinary cohomology groups uh -huh. of the variety, and that should be really easy. To figure out, yeah, that's just the ordinary cohomology groups of uh, a torus. <laughs> yeah, of the, the, two. the the fourth Cartesian power of the circle. Uh -huh. um, in the middle column, that is has its own kind of. Uh, Pleasant attractiveness. It's the coherent cohomology, according to if I understand the, you know. I mean, it's there's all sorts of interesting things about it, but in particular, it's just we we know a priori that it should be just. I think we know a priori. It's just be complex vector spaces, um, you know, because the the sheaf is a sheaf of complex vector spaces. Uh -huh. And um, I think that makes sense. And the um, right-hand column should be the higher Picard groups, including the, the classical non-higher Picard group. Uh, so let's just start trying to fill some of this out. So the, the left-hand side should be really easy, right? I mean, don't tell me yet what it is, but I mean, right, it should just be, uh, it should look kind of like an exterior algebra or something or something like that uh, a little bit. It should have that flavor, but it's very lattice uh, And <laughs> Let's see, let's see. Uh, well, right, okay, so, so, so let me try to fill in some of this. So, um, uh, so I guess the important thing is trying to figure out, you know, which way does the table get filled in? Uh, like the connecting homomorphisms, it'd be nice if I can arrange them to point downwards. I guess it's gonna work. So it's gonna be something like, uh, uh, so this is gonna be the, yeah, we'll have rows and this will be like the zeroth row and the first row and the second row, third row, et cetera. Oh. And um, 
so th so that will be the the index of the cohomology group. Is that the right word? Index. Um, so. Uh, Let's see. So, th so this should be something like uh, I'm guessing it's something like one, four, six, four, one. Does that make any sense? Let's see. <clears throat> um, is it? No. Should I be? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't tell me yet. Let me think. Uh, I guess that makes sense. Okay. I guess that's the right index. Here. Yep. That sounds good. But what do I mean by that? I, I, I really just mean that it's... Uh, yeah, you could write Z to the one if you wanted to make it easier right. to compare them with the other ones that are not, they're gonna be more like vector spaces. <laughs> well, one of them is. <laughs> okay. And maybe I should go down a little bit further so we can see where it trails off. Does that make sense? Let's see. The highest thing is four in the fourth column. I think this all makes sense. I haven't, I'm just really, really ha haven't stared concretely at these concrete examples in a while. Um, so let's see. Uh, all right. So right. So let's start trying to do the allegedly easy case where. Um, where I think I can get it to work, which is when it's not generic. So that's the case where, all right, so let me think. So, uh, so the Picard group, Is going to be like the abelian variety itself uh, in in the identity component. So, sorry, yeah, the Picard group, which is what H one, H super one with coefficients in the multiplicative group. Um, yeah, right. So you mean it's like the dual of the abelian variety? Ah, I wasn't even being that careful. Um, but yeah, uh, okay. So if you're not, uh, then yeah. Yeah, uh, anyway. okay, so kind of like it, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, as a group, it's the same, I guess, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, right, but yeah, so, okay, let me say, Well, at some point, at, you know, actually, at some point when I was writing these charts, I actually like didn't even write the Z for Z's in. I just um, wrote in the lattice ranks. So these things are, if the lattice ranks of these are in the middle are all zero, because these are just complex vector spaces. And now what are the lattice ranks of these things over here, the, the, the Picard groups? Um, so when you say the lattice rank, you mean like you, you look at the connected components? Yeah, and at some point you and I convinced ourselves that there wasn't gonna be any torsion here. Did we really convince ourselves of that? Um, yeah, that's, that, I mean, I, I, So I, I just yeah, have to write it's... down the rank of these lattices and that tells us the, uh, the the yeah well i mean why do we even know <laughs> why do we even know that these things yeah i'm thinking in a very low brow way here i'm thinking that the, that we can treat all of these cohomology groups as being like topological being groups i'm not sure i have any principal reason for why they should, we should be think, able to think of them as topological at all um but we do seem to be thinking of them that way um yeah, they are. Um, I don't know the general. All right, so, so I'm, yeah, so, so I'm going to proceed to, to think that way. And um, 
then I'm trying to decide what the I don't know whether I pressed some key accidentally or something. Let's see. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, Sorry, I'm doing a terrible job here. So what's the Hodge diamond here? The Hodge diamond for this surface is something like uh, one, two, one, 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 two, two, one, and four, like that. And that's why we're getting the one, four, six, four, one. That's one of the reasons to see that we're getting one, four, six, four, one. And, um, Let's see, somehow these things here are also supposed to be telling us the coherent cohomology or something like that? Um, yeah, if you're reading this from the bottom, <laughs> so this, yeah, if the bottom one is the zero, zero, I thought you read yes. this from the top usually, but okay. Uh, so, but not in this case, I wasn't. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I have these two pictures reversed here. That's right. This okay. picture, this picture is reversed relative to. Okay. You could fix it just picture. by making the red circle be some other one, two, one, without, right? Yeah, yeah, but I, I never think of it that way. But oh, oh, all right. Okay. Well. Like anyway, yeah. Um. So yeah, um, that's a theorem that the the this what you're calling coherent cohomology, which I don't know if I've ever heard anyone. Call it that. I don't know. Uh, is maybe it did. Maybe I, 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 I might have misread, but I thought that's what somebody called it. Yeah. Anyway, um, it is this also this uh, this the purely holomorphic part of this bigraded cohomology. Right? What's that? Double cohomology. So yeah. Anyway, the short answer is yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, like I said, I'm doing a total job of this, but let, let me see if we can find what I'm doing here. Let's see. I mean, I'll give up in a moment if I if I if I just can't get this to work. Um, it's going fine so far, but I guess that's I guess you don't want it to go fine. So. <laughs> well, you know, for this special case, we do want it to go fine. Um, it's just that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not. Yeah, uh, I'm just not sure. I really found the right notes here because. I have a note here that's in some notes here where it's discussing the abelian threefold case. Which let's see, let's see. Uh, what am I trying to say? So I seem to be getting something like, well, so if we're, right, if we're just writing down the lattice ranks, then we, then we should be writing out down these higher, higher neuron severity ranks, 
right? And, and so I think what we're getting is something like, what am I trying to say? It's something like four, I think it's like four, four, one. I mean, it says here that in my email that the maximal alignment assumption, okay, that's the, the special case, the higher neuron severity numerology seems to go four, four comma one with zeros before and after that. But what did I mean by that? Um, so does that make any sense? Four, four and one? How can this be? So, okay, so the, there, there are, okay. They're supposed to be, Connecting homomorphisms. I'm doing the connecting homomorphisms the right way. It's going like this. Okay, okay. Oh, I, okay, so there's a one and a one and a zero, okay. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Maybe I, so maybe I am sort of remembering. So, okay, <laughs> sorry, this is painful to watch. But um, what am I trying to say that, Let's see, so one and one, four and four, six and four. What's going on there? Um, oh, okay, let's see, maybe we can get that word. There's a one, right? I, see, what I'm trying to get is I'm trying to get, right? So if you have a long exact sequence of, objects in some category, then in very tame cases, it will morally break up into very, very short exact sequence. So one kind of very short exact sequence here is, is like the ones where we can see like the one and the one right there, right? That's like a little exact sequence all by itself. You know, zero, one, one, zero, uh -huh, uh -huh. and zero, four, four, zero. And so I'm trying to account for as much of that as we can. So we've got, uh, you know, like that, that little thing is sort of all by itself. That little thing is all by itself. Then here we've got six and four. So what does that mean? That means that I mean, there's something yeah. funny about just keeping track of the lattice ranks. Maybe you understand that better than me, but like, <clears throat> like you could have a, you could have like Z included into R. And so Z would have lattice rank one and R would have lattice rank zero. Right, 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 right. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm doing a terrible job here, but let me, uh, let me try to find the part of, the discussion. All right, all right, let's see.
All right. Okay. 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 So it says in some very tame categories, every exact sequence is in a not very canonical way, a direct sum of translates of just a few special indecomposable examples. For example, in the category of complex vector spaces, every exact sequence is built from really just one, from copies of just one single exact sequence. You just, you know, zero mapping to one dimensional thing, mapping to one dimensional thing, mapping to zero. Yeah. Okay. So offhand, I'm wondering whether all of the exact sequences we have to worry about for now are built from uh, just a few special examples. So one of them would be, you know, the same kind that we were talking about, of zero. Yeah. So 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 one right. We could have we could have ones that go zero to v to v to zero, where v is either the integers or the reals or the reals module of the integers. So those are possible examples. And the only other one that we're expecting to show up here, that I'm expecting to show up here, is you know the famous one, the, the exponential one itself. Um, Z going to the reals, going to re reals mod integers. Um, and then it says here, okay, it says, as furthermore, I'm imagining, my, I, it actually, my email is not that bad. So it's actually helpful if I read it out. Furthermore, I'm imagining that when we draw the long exact cohomology sequence in three column format, the three columns will each have their own distinct individual flavor. The left-hand sheaf is really just the tensor unit discrete abelian group. So that whole left column of sheaf cohomology groups is just the ordinary discrete cohomology groups. The middle co column is really just the tensor unit coherent sheaf. So, you know, I think that means that it's the coherent sheaf cohomology in the middle. Um, and then, yeah, and that's the higher Picard groups on the right-hand side. Uh, I would find this a lot easier to yeah. follow if your three column chart here actually showed the yeah, all groups of this stuff. instead of this sort of partial right. information. Right, right, right. Um, Can't we just like go ahead and do that? Start doing that? <laughs> yes. Okay. But, yes, but I'm, I'm desperately trying to. Uh, uh, to to follow what I'm going, going, going along here. Look, 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 let, me, let me see if I can get this to work. Let me see. Um, so, okay, okay. So it says, the distinct, right, it says, right. The distinctive flavor of each column suggests that the, that the you know, the really classical ones should actually, should always fit exactly the way you think. You know what I mean? So, so I mean, there are these really, really short exact sequences, ones that are just two things yeah. neighboring to each other. Uh -huh. And we'll figure out where those can show up. But the only other things that should show up here are things that fit exactly in one row. Yeah. And, and that are okay. exactly the, of the classic type. You know, uh -huh. getting a torus as a vector space mod a lattice. Um, yeah, that all sounds great. And I'm just itching so, to have you draw the yes. groups so that we can like start seeing that stuff. Yes, yes. But but I'm just trying to so so which ones are but of the of the really short ones, which ones are we expecting to show up and where should they show up? So like clearly we're getting some that are you know in connecting position, right? We're getting yeah, some those, in connecting yeah, position, so, and those are the ones where it's discrete. Uh, right? Yeah, I, so it's been long enough that I forget like why, I forget a bunch of stuff about the third column, but in the two blue cases that you marked, we know yeah. that the third column is isomorphic to the first column. So in that case, anyway, we could just tell right off the bat that that, that four and that one in the third column is z to the four. And I mean, that the, the whole group is just z to the four and z to the one. So yeah, that's 
that's true. I'm confused about where you're getting this four and this one from in general. Are you just getting it from, well, here, I mean, I can see where you're getting this four and this one from. It's, it's because you've got this long exact sequence with a zero on either side of, of these two entries. So is that how you got it? I think like so. I think yeah. so. But, okay. but at the moment, I'm just trying to uh, clarify where the super short exact sequences can show up, in which columns they can show up. So I'm saying there's nothing, dis there's nothing discrete in the middle at all. It's just vector spaces in the middle. So you can't have any of the, sh the super short ones uh, that involve anything discrete have to be in the connecting position. So the way that you're allowed to glom together these super short ones with other ones is only by direct sums, not any yes. kind of extension tricks. That's right, right. Yeah, now, you know, I, I've been guessing that that's all you can do with these topological abelian groups, unless something gets really untamed or something like that. Well, R is an extension. Wait, no, what am I trying to say? Yeah. Sorry, what am I saying? R is an extension <laughs> of the circle by the integers, right? Well, if I understand what you mean, that's the really classic one, right? That's right. the one that fits yeah. right. straight across one row. Right. But what I'm worrying, I'm just like theoretically worrying that like. You might be right. Yeah, you, we should you worry might, about that. You might have like the inner, you said like, okay, there's this like this super short one with the integers and the integers. But then it could be like, if you, depending on what the rules of the game are, that could be like sitting inside and it's something that that's like an extension. So in other words, one of those integers could be sitting inside an R. Depending on what you, depending on what you're, <laughs> depending on what you're letting yourself do, and maybe it's a maybe it's a theorem that all long exact sequences of locally compact abelian groups just break up into these as direct sums of these three kinds. Yeah, I, mean, I meant locally compact. Uh, I meant. Uh, Locally compact, really tame. <laughs> Locally compact. I'm sorry, I just mean Lie groups, civilian Lie groups. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. 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 I'm making some very naive guess that we're only going to have to deal with the, these direct sums of these very short ones and then the really classic ones. And that the uh -huh. very classic ones are just going to sit in a single row. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm willing to go with that until we run into trouble and then exactly. that would be like one of my ways to try to wheel out of the exactly trouble. exactly yeah. exactly so the super short the super <laughs> short ones of the discrete flavor have to lie in the connecting position but we can yeah. also ask about the super short ones of the compact flavor and the super short ones of the non-compact flavor um so where could they live uh let's see so i mean if you follow all these rules the the, the compact flavor, the circles can't be sitting in the left hand column. Well, that's not so obvious. I mean, that's really obvious. You can't have any circles in the left hand column. And you also can't have any circles in the middle column as some ends, because the middle column is vector spaces. Well, let me um, tell you can I tell you what my email says here? Yeah. My email claims. That the super short ones with the little circle things seem unlikely altogether. Yeah, so that's just what I was okay. slowly working with. I'm saying, <laughs> let me just finish what I was saying. Yeah, so they can't, they, those super short ones with circles in them, they can't touch the left hand column, correct? Uh, so they can't touch it. Yeah, that's right. Neither, neither of them could, neither of the two participants can be the left hand column. Yeah, that rules yeah. out two out of the three locations for super short ones. So the only location that super short one could occupy is in like the middle and right hand column. 
but right and I, but, the, right. but then you're but then you are claiming your your rules of the game say that like you can't have a circle sitting inside a vector space so and i and i was just like annoyingly pointing out that you can think of a vector space as an extension of the integers by a circle but but the circle can't be a sum end of a vector space so so the circle so that rules out the other possibility that rules out that it's in the in the that this super short thing of circles is in the right hand the middle and right column so i agreed okay okay and then and then the email also says i'm less sure about the other signs the ones with the non compact names it says seems like we'll need one near the top but not sure yet whether we'll need more. So do you see the one near, are we seeing the one near the top? Can you so, move back up to the top? Okay. I can't see the top. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, well it's, I written, know. it's written very sloppily, but. Uh, well, but right now it's invisible. Okay. And there's this big mysterious blank. Yeah. But that has got to be a, <laughs> no, sorry, what does that got to be? Uh, so, so doesn't that have to be a four or two? Uh, oh no, these zeros in the middle are misleading. These zeros are lattice. Yeah. Never mind. I no, wish that, you wouldn't that, do. It. Yeah, I wish you just write the whole actual group. Then we can like tell what's going on. Um, I don't oh, like this business of you just okay. calling the lattice rank because okay. it's like I can't tell what. Um. All right. So. Okay, I like this. I'm gonna like this. Okay, so this is uh, Z, Z to the one, Z, uh -huh, yeah. and this is C to the one, and this is. Uh, well, let's leave that one blank. Group. Well, but uh, but it should be right. It has to be. What am I trying to say? It's just. The, the sections? What am I trying to say? Um, oh, the global uh, sections? Global invertible. So that's, yeah. Okay, so that's zero then. Ah, uh, really? Um, Wait, sorry. No, they're constant sections. Sorry, never mind. Sorry, never mind. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, they're only the constant sections. So it's just a circle. So just a, just a, just a, not a, well, we were calling it a circle. It's a C star. We were calling circ. I was saying circle a whole bunch of times just now when I really meant. Oh, but I think when I was saying circle, I think I really did mean circle. You know, maybe I meant it in general. But anyway, notice this thing. But I just write now. Okay. Anyway, this thing is C star. Uh, well, but so it's got a circle in it, but it's not. You know what? Okay, but I think what I want to do. Um, oh, come on. Just humor me. Just you're, fill out well, the stuff that's easy to fill out. Yeah, no, but I, I think the point is this is R. What am I trying to say? This is R2. R2. And this is. Um, R1 plus S1 or something like that. Okay. Right, this is going on the theory that we just have these three flavor is and we're gonna something like that um I, okay i'm gonna draw my own because i don't like that <laughs> I, well, I know i yes, can see right it, away it, yeah. it's just that in my email i specifically said that you know yes maybe there are complex manifold structures on these or, or complex something structures on these but i don't want to worry about the complex structure right I, you know i'm just gonna try to keep track of what what these are as uh, mixtures of anyway. circles circles Okay, but Lattices I'm not gonna. I'm not. Yeah, but I'm not gonna. Yeah, no. Okay, okay that's fine. That's fine. Because <laughs> um, I can see the map from C to C star, but I don't. I get fooled if I think of a map from R two to R one times S one. So. So I have to draw my own notes here. Okay, so this is um, right. I think this is R two R four R two. 
and zero, zero. And um, right, and then we're trying to figure out what these things are over here. So, right, I mean, right, I, I presumably you would rather write this as, you know, I wrote it as R2, R4, R2, but you presumably you'd rather write it as C1, C2, C1. Right. But I, I'm deliberately trying to, you know, just not worry about the complex structure. Um, yeah, I mean, but, you know, it's, as usual, it's your job to try to catch where it is that I'm making some really stupid mistake because I, I must be making some really stupid mistake. So, um, uh, so, So this first blank one, yeah, is the Picard group. First blank one, yeah, is the Picard group, right? Which is, um, in, yeah, in the example that we're thinking of, it's like z to the fourth. plus S one to the four, is that right? Uh, yes. Yep, so a line bundle is classified by its a holomorphic line bundle. So this thing is classifying holomorphic line bundles and line holomorphic line bundles are classified by their churn class, which is that Z to the fourth business. Yeah. Which is also like, you can see, wait, not Z to the fourth, Z to the, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Topologically, there's uh, this is z to the sixth. Yeah. Um, so you wrote z to the fourth, but you mean z to the sixth, right? No, I don't think so. Right. Um, what am I trying to say? Um, you know, the near and severity group. is so what am i trying to say the picard group maps to I, I i could be completely screwed up so you know try and fix me if i'm doing it wrong but the, the picard group you know the process of taking the underlying topological line bundle of a whole morphic line bundle that maps us from the picard group to yeah that is right <laughs> That is the connecting homomorphism. The connecting homomorphism is going from this. Yeah, the connecting homomorphism is going from the Picard group to the topological line bundles, which is this z, z to the sixth right over here. And okay. it doesn't hit the whole z to the sixth. Yeah, okay. Um, and that has something to do with the fact that, right, there's this whole six right here, but it's only four in the middle that, um, <laughs> well, that has something to do with it. Um, uh, I mean, that, that, that puts some, yeah, that puts some sort of upper bound on what the near and severity rank could be. I think the highest in the near and severity rank can get is four. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really forgetting stuff now. Yeah, me too, but, um, it's right. good to <laughs> <laughs> we really should have done this one illustration our months. Um, so let's see. So
I mean, it doesn't seem like it has to be z, z to the one here. Just, you know, it just has to be. You know, um, because it's got those two zeros that it's. Yep, yeah, that, that's, yeah. yeah, that's. And I, yeah, I seem to be claiming that, that what, there was some, Let's see, let's see. So, well, right, I'm, right, I'm, I'm still claiming that, that in this case, we can get away with just thinking of it as mostly just two kinds of, uh, right, I mean, uh, right, is this making sense that I, I'm claiming that up here, there's like a, a, a one copy of, Right, it's like R to the one, and this is R to the one, and right. So there's an R, right? There's a there's one of those like little non-compact things that goes in the second and third columns, and aside from that, it's just that that other two types, the ones that fill the whole row, and the connecting ones, uh -huh. which are discrete. And um, so is this is this working now? So we've got yes, we've got Z Z one going into R one and mapping down to S one, right? So what I'm saying that there's no connecting thing there. How can that work? Okay. Um, Which one are you wondering about? I'm trying to get exactness around here. I'm wondering about exactness around there. I'm, I'm, agonizing over what happens around there. Uh, uh, okay. So I think that one is like, that's all brand new Z4 stuff and it gets mapped to the to the R4 and then to the S1 to the four. Oh, so that really is an autonomous row almost all by itself. I think that's the only explanation, possible explanation of that, yeah. Right, right. And that leaves, um, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So, okay, so, so, so it looks like the row mm -hmm. zero looks like it's completely doing its own thing. And, and it involves, you know, one of those full row things. And then it involves just, you know, it's the, the only example where we have columns two and three uh, ha having something you know, interacting all by themselves. And then, okay, as, and then as you say, in, in row one, uh, there's that, you know, full row thing, but that doesn't account for the Z to the fourth over on the right-hand side. So that Z to the fourth must be going, yeah, that must be, that must be connecting with a connecting thing. So that, you know, we have a Z six there, but, it's only accounting uh -huh. for the z to the fourth. Uh -huh. So that's leaving a z squared going into an r squared going into an s1 squared. Is that right? And then plus z to the fourth? I guess it's got to be as Z to the fourth, because of that zero there coming up <laughs> after the Z to the fourth. Does this make any sense? I like it. I mean, I, well, <laughs> I don't have a strong, so this is like an example of a higher Picard group, that green thing you just wrote. Yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah. So I don't have enough intuition 
for those, but so I can't like look at it and say like, oh yeah, that's great. <laughs> but but it okay. seems to be consistent. Okay, okay. But now, okay, so this seems to work. But 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 now we've heard rumors of, I mean, and maybe maybe at some point we even understood in some specific examples, but 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 we we still really need to go back and clarify those examples. But we've heard about cases where the near and severity rank is just one alleged um, for an abeing surface. So now the whole left-hand column, the ordinary cohomology thing, that's not going to change. Agreed? Sorry, the whole? The whole left-hand column is, is not going to change. That's still the same. Sorry, still the same for what? For any? For, for this case that we've heard about, or, or I've heard about, I've heard rumors of, I'm still confused about, where the, the, the classical near and severity uh -huh. rank will be one instead of four. Okay. The left-hand column is just topological. So yeah, it doesn't care about cases. That's right. That's right. Uh -huh. Now, do we, do we think the Hodge diamond is gonna be the same? Do, do, do we think that Hodge diamond is still gonna look like this in the case where the near and severity rank is one? Yeah, I think so. So that like that big four in the middle has to do with the fact that, let's see, you have, so if you, you can write, write it down using Durham cohomology, complex Durham cohomology. And so you've got like coordinates Z1 and Z2 and then Z1 bar and Z2 bar. And what are you saying? You're saying that you can tell that for any abelian surface, it's going to still work out the same way? So there will be, and I, I suspect you're right. So, go ahead, right? Yeah. I think so. So the idea is that like you have this basis of translation invariant closed differential forms, yeah. which are pretty simple on a torus, on, on, on an abelian variety. Yeah. And so, so here you can think of them, you can write that basis in terms of two holomorphic ones, which people call like DZ1 and DZ2, two anti-holomorphic ones, DZ1 bar and DZ2 bar. And then this middle four here says, pick one from the holomorphic column and pick one from the anti-holomorphic column. Yeah. And so you get two times two choices of, of those forms. So you can like DZ1 wedge, DZ2 bar, and three other choices like that. And I think that's, so I think that's just all, I think that's just independent of which abelian variety you've got, yeah. All right, so it sounds like you're saying that the whole middle column has to be the same too. And, and, You know, to what extent are the maps from the first column to the second column? To what extent do those still have to stay the same? Uh, Sorry, from the what to the what? From the first column to the second column, the induced maps on the code now. Uh, I mean, you, you can sort of see where I'm going, right? I mean, it's going to be, how are we going to manage to get the third, you know, when the first two columns are staying so much the same, how can the third column manage to be so different? Well, it's not the third column that's so different. I mean, the third column looks like this. We figured out what the third column looks like. No, I'm saying in, in, the, generic case, the, in the generic case, I'm saying. Oh, what I'm claiming is that this is how it looks in any case. Um, and no, 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 the, no. Am I like totally confused? This is the, you know, that four there is the Naran Severia. Um, I think you're making, I think that's the mistake you're making. Okay, it could be. What's the I mistake? Think that, I think this, the mistake you're making has to, 
do with it's the it's the what's changed the neuron severity group is not readable from the stuff we've written so far it's it it involves the details of them of some maps that we have and also some extra structure that we that is not in this chart so for um and the extra structure is how the let's, I mean, let's see ah, what's the extra structure right so the extra structure is how the sorry the extra structure has to <laughs> this has to do with the Yeah, I have I had written about this stuff and so I'm staring at this stuff I yes I, yes I, I'd, yes I, I'd written about yes um, so there's a kind of yeah there's a description of the neuron severity group which is that it's like the, sorry, it's hard for me to translate it from what I'm, from what I'm reading to what's on your- Sure, 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 sure. On your chart. I mean, I could, can I try to give the counterpoint so, so that you can, you know, let, let me make it very clear what I'm trying to claim and then you can really try to show how that's wrong. Okay. So I thought you were telling me at some point or maybe I was telling you, I thought that, you know, you have this, I thought we could get away with thinking of the Picard group as being a topological abelian group, even an abelian league group, perhaps. And that you could just take the component group of that abelian league group, and that that would be the neuron severity group, just the components of this Picard group. Um, no, <laughs> let's see. I think the answer to that is, is no. So, I mean, I wish I could, I wish I could track down where I got that impression from, but go ahead. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Actually, hold on. I could be screwed up. Okay. Uh, so you're claiming that the components. I, I'm trying to claim that. Yes. That the components of the Picard group. Maybe, sorry, maybe I, I may completely change my no into a, a yes. Sure, sure, there's there's sure. no there's no there's no non embarrassing way to switch straight from a no to a, a yes. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, hold hold on. Now that you're talking about this component stuff, I had some very clear uh i had some very clear statement about that component stuff some that i wrote down somewhere okay okay i mean there's so many things i'm completely unclear on here like i don't even understand why there's a topology on the card group but allegedly maybe there is yeah it has to do with there's some kind of stack of line bundles so it's sort of like it's more than just like a holomorphic line bundles it's more than just like a set of isomorphism classes of them they're defined by transition functions and you can like talk about two transition functions being close to each other yeah that probably makes um, sense that probably makes sense i'm just not completely clear on the details but Okay, yeah, okay, so, okay, so, yeah, so I completely re reverse. Let's see. 
Okay. So I completely reverse my position. So, okay, so now I finally get what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, the, the Picard group, its identity component is called the Picard variety. And then its group of connected components is the neuron severi group. Okay. And so, okay, so, okay. So this, so this third column, is going gonna, is gonna to depend on on what uh, well we hope we think it is going to depend on what kind of abelian surface we have and so what you've done is like the maximally nice case and we've right. seen with like in, in particular the, not generic so the opposite generic right so so in this maximally nice case that z four in, circled in green is key and 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 it's mapping into this C six and sort of hitting yeah hitting four out of the six. <laughs> And then the remaining two out of the six go on to lead to merry life in column in row uh, two here. Yes, giving like giving us like a z squared r squared s one squared thing. That's what I think. Yes. Okay. So. So, but anyway, now it sounds like what you're what you're trying to do is you're trying to what we should try to do is to redraw this chart or a portion, the relevant portion of this chart in the non, in the generic case. Yes. And you're gonna to try to convince me like it's impossible or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, particularly, so I particularly if I, cannot, I can decide from my email where I, yeah, I claim that it actually is impossible, but, it, but even without deciding from my email, it almost looks like it's gonna be difficult, right? Because well, again, I, want, I want you to start. I can't think about it until you start, you or I start drawing it. So let's. Can you just like humor me and start drawing? Like you just need to draw rows one and two. Yes. Based on the sort of alternate assumption. Yes. I mean, I was gonna you know try to claim that it's almost the same picture, but let's see. Uh, okay. So. So. Uh, I don't know what colors I'm going to use here. So yes, I, I mean, and a, a lot of things are still the same, right? It's still, right? I mean, part of the point is right, one of the reasons I didn't even want to use, one of the reasons I did want to use the same old picture and just erase the third column was because, you know, I'm claiming that the third column should be the only thing that changes. But you okay? But you can't have just the. Third. <laughs> I mean, at least the map. Anyway, let's. Yeah, maybe the maps are different. Maybe the maps are different between first and second column. But let's see. So, so we have. Um, what is it? It's, it's it's still. Z to the one and Z to the fourth, and Z to the sixth. In the first column. And then, okay, and then what is it in the middle column? In the middle column, it's still, well, I, yeah, if, if I understand what you're saying, then because of the Hodge diamond staying the same, you know, you, I think you've tried to convince me that the Hodge diamond stays the same. And that means that the second, the middle column is gonna stay very similar. So it's still gonna be, R squared, R to the fourth, R squared, and then, you know, and then that kind of, so this is like Z to the fourth, and this is zero. And um, yeah, so, right. so we, maybe we don't know yet what these maps are, but we could try to think about it. Yeah, maybe I didn't put enough 
thought into thinking about what these maps are now. Maybe that's what you're trying to tell me, that I really have to think about different maps here. Um, and, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. confused, but I do know that it, from the stuff that I'd written <laughs> that, that, it, that the maps are important, yeah. So, uh, okay, so, uh, we're still going to get, right? We're still going to get like, what is it? Uh, you you want to write it as C star here or something like that? Yep, or R plus S1, whatever. Yeah, you R plus, want. okay, I'll write it as R plus S1, but you can write it as, you can, you can write it in terms of complex stuff. Okay. And again, what are the maps? I don't know. Oh, and uh, sorry, I didn't leave very much room for connecting all the morphisms here. And um, yeah, so okay, so what's going on? Is there any contradiction here? Yeah, let's see. Let me see if I can find. I mean, well, I think you should write in your guess for that first blank entry. Z to the one plus plus what? Still S one to the fourth, I believe. I think the S one to the fourth. Yeah, that still sounds right. Yeah, right. The the identity component still sounds the same. Yeah. And yeah, so what's going on here? Um, well, while you're staring at that, I'm going to stare at my email so I can find the part of the email where it claims to find a contradiction or something like that. Can I can I read something here? What in my it says in my email? Okay. It says, however, once we face the generic case where our maximal alignment assumption fails, things seem a lot less tame. For example, let's consider a generic abelian surface where we're pretty sure that the neuron severity rank is supposed to be one instead of four, then it seems like something has to give now. The connecting homomorphism from the rank one neuron severity group to the rank six second integral cohomology has image of rank one at most. So the next map in the exact sequence has to fit a five dimensional lattice inside of a complex vector space. Either that map must have non-closed image, which seems like an annoying possibility to me, though I can imagine the failure of maximal alignment might lead to such annoyance, or else the second coherent cohomology in the middle column has to be roomier than it is in the maximal alignment case. Yeah, okay, you see what I'm just claiming there? Right, I'm, does that make sense? I'm claiming that... Uh -huh. So you've got this Z to the five, yeah, yeah, right, right. We have the six minus one That's gives you five, and that five dimensional lattice has to fit into that R squared there, which it can't do, you know. 
except in a very dusty way. Uh-huh. Well. So that's, I think that's my complaint. Okay. That's, that's, that's my complaint. Good. And, and, and it's, yeah. And, and, and I, and there could be all sorts of idiotic, stupid mistakes in everything that I said, you know, where I, like you said, we're taking the, you know, we're, we're making every place we can, we're making tameness assumptions. So things are going to work out nicely. And we've gotten ourselves in a jam where that clearly gets us in trouble. So, so where have, where have we been? I mean, we've been over optimistic everywhere, but can you pin it down to exactly where we've been unforgivably over optimistic? Uh-huh. Uh, and, and, and again, I apologize for this. Is how ridiculously. Nah, no, it's fine. Actually, okay. Actually, I think it's good that we okay. are doing this after we forgot <laughs> everything, because otherwise, I would just forget it. Uh -huh. um, I mean, it's not like I would have remembered it if we didn't do this. <laughs> okay. okay, okay. So, so this is like forcing me to remember this stuff. Okay. And it's annoying that. We've forgotten it, but but I, I want I don't want to forget it, so I want to. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So it's good to dig into it. Um, again, again, you're trying to, you know, part of your job is to find all the mistakes in the, you know, I, I just said something which sounded like it almost made sense, but did it really make sense? You know, I said that you subtract the six minus the one gives you the five, and you have to fit that five into the next thing. The yeah. Next thing is a. So what I yeah uh huh. So what I okay, I've translated translated what I wrote mentally into a language that is sort of compatible with what we're talking about here. Okay. And so what I was one of the things I was pointing out. Is that like one way? One other way to think about the neuron severity group is it's isomorphic to. Unfortunately, all these maps of yours don't have names; they just have question marks. Yes. On top of them. So. Yes. Uh, so okay. So I have to talk slowly. So. So see that question mark map going from the Z six to the R two. Yes. So the neuron severity group, one way to think of it is it's the intersection of two things. It's the intersection of the image of that map. Yeah. And the kernel? No. Well, and the and one way to think about it is the image of that map and the integral. Cohomology. So there, there's a, there is a. So, 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 sorry, sorry. So, so, say it again. Which map? The map, the map going from z six to to r squared. squared. Yeah. The image of that map. So it's the intersection of the image of that map and what? So. Ah, uh, sorry. Sorry, what's going on? Uh, sorry, it's really confusing. I mean, I really do wish that I could remember some of the things I was thinking about back then. I mean, it is good looking at it fresh, but it's, <laughs> I, I didn't want it to look at, at it that fresh. Can you stand looking at some stuff I wrote? Sure. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, yeah, yes. I'm going to share my screen then. Okay. Do I have to? No, you can just. No, take you don't it. have to. Yeah, you okay. don't have to do anything. Okay. Okay. This stuff here. Okay. And this is from the, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's from the N category cafe. Yeah. So, I think okay. it's good to start at the beginning of the proof rather than to show you what it is that I'm trying to prove. Okay, but I am, as you're talking, I am making some attempt to, you know, compare what's on your screen now to what's on my screen that you can't see. Okay. Sure, yeah. So, so here's this, yeah. So here's this exponential long exact sequence. Does C stand for connecting? C is for connecting. Yeah. 
I is like so because it sort of comes from the inclusion of the integers into the sure complexes, and E is like for exponential. Okay. Okay. Fair Here enough. Here I all, all these idiotic, annoying subscripts to like say where, which one you're doing. Sure. Okay. 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 So by definition, the neuron severity group is the image of one of these connecting homomorphisms. Now let me just try and get straight. What's the classical? Is a subscript here. It's n equals one, or does it even uh, matter? <laughs> it does matter. Well, it matters. Yeah. It's, okay. It's good. To, it's good. To, it matters for our. So for n equals one. So we got h one. It's like the we got these classification of. So the morphic line bundles, the connecting homomorphism maps them to the classification of the topological line bundles. And the image of that connecting homomorphism is like the topological line bundles that admit a holomorphic structure. And that's the neuron severity group. So, so yeah, n equals one. And this eight, yeah. Uh -huh. So you get like H2 with integral coefficients. That's like the topological classification of line bundles. So yeah. So let's just think about n equals one. Yes, n equals one. That's right. That's okay. what we care about. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay. So it's the image of that connecting homomorphism. Yes. But, but also. Right. It's the image of that therefore, connecting homomorphism. That's, yeah. That's useful. Yes. Yeah. And therefore, it's the kernel of the next homomorphism. Right. Let me just stare at that. Let me just let me just pause to right soak that one in right. So if the neuron severity group is getting smaller in the generic case, smaller than <laughs> smaller than the case we understand, yes. Then the image of the connecting homomorphism is smaller. And therefore, the kernel of the next homomorphism has got to be smaller. And that's, that's right. what was perturbing. It seems perturbing me, yes. Yeah, because it seems scary that you've got a, a map exactly, yeah. from Z6 to R squared that has its kernel being just Z. But I think the I mean, I think that's just true. I think I think it is, I think that's. That's true, and that's just like that's the weird. I think this weird, dusty, annoying stuff is sort of going to be this. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way before, so it's really good we're talking about this. But I think that dustiness is this lack of alignment. It's, it's like this annoyingness, <laughs> but it's still possible. Yeah, I'm trying to remember how bad I thought the dustiness was last time. I mean, right? Maybe it's just right. Maybe you just have to face up to that dustiness. Um, and yeah, you know, and it just explodes a lot of the tameness assumptions that I was trying to. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I, I then go ahead and I analyze it further, but actually now that I'm thinking about it, analyzing it further doesn't, in a way it doesn't help a whole lot. Um, all right, so it really it really helps it really helps now that you're saying that you can see what I was complaining about, even if it turns out that you know my complaint wasn't really legitimate. You can see why it seems legitimate. Yeah. Um, so in particular, this leaves me with the homework of uh, thinking more about this and seeing if I really think I could turn this into more than just an unpleasantness. You know, can I can I turn this into a an actual contradiction with anything that we're supposed to believe. Um, uh, but but even if I can't, I really have to. I have to think about you know what is this? What you know? What, why do I? Why does this seem un, un, unpleasant to me? I mean, does, yeah. What's what does it mean? Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, I well, I don't know. I mean, of course, it's unpleasant to think about dense 
Yeah. Dense. Dense. Uh, yeah, dense anything. Yeah. Dense, but not every. <laughs> sorry, what's the word for for not everything? Dense proper subgroups of a vector space. Yeah. yeah. Um, but. But actually, yeah, I mean, what it's making me want to do is like actually like find like the simplest generic case. Right, find right. And then like find, actually like work it out and see this dense thing. Right, find a totally non-generic generic <laughs> right. thing right. that you can actually see it. Right. Yep. And the we, more yeah, generic and we, something and we, is, and the harder it is to get an example. <laughs> We've talked about that. Right? I mean, or was it, well, maybe it was Dan Peponi <laughs> and me who was talking about that, or maybe it was we were talking about like how it's really hard to prove that numbers are transcendental. And so we were sort of joking that like the, the more common something is, like the harder it is to find yeah. an example, or <laughs> unless yeah. it's everything. Yeah. Or something. yeah, yeah. But 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 I think you know, just when we were thinking about this stuff, we did think about this general idea of you know trying to come up with specific generic examples no yep. um and yeah i think we still really need some of those and and yeah and, right and i think i was even right i think that was part of my motivation for thinking about the uh the uh what am i trying to say the uh golden integers and stuff like that. I think I had some uh -huh. alleged examples of, you know, involving the uh, uh -huh. yeah. roots of uh, the fifth roots of unity, trying to get an obedience service, trying to cook up an obedience service from the fifth roots of unity, uh -huh. which would be, you know, very, very specific, very, very special. But I was hoping that it would actually be generic in this sense, even if, even uh -huh. if it's a very special example. So, um, well, I and, hope then, we, and then that project yeah. got diverted from, you know, away from, got diverted by a whole bunch of other projects, but go ahead. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I hope you get back to that in this. Yes. Yes. And maybe we should not attempt to say anything more about this now and we should sure. like, come sure, around next fine. week and try to. Sure. That's fine. That's fine. To, I would love, I'd love to get back to this abelian surface stuff and this nothing like having like a concrete paradox quasi paradox to to motivate me to because right it's it. in that fifth you know in that very special example of the fifth roots of unity i'm not i'm not sure i completely understand that example yet but it seems like it should be a very specific example and it's just so hard to believe that you're going to get anything you know ugly, i can't even remember. ugly <laughs> ugly and dust like and dense proper from that but maybe you could i mean yeah, you really could, but but I want to see it happen. I want to see what happens. I want to see what I mean, it the, gives. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, the golden field is itself dust-like, right? Sure, sure. So that's right. it's it's just, that's right. That's true. That's true. It's, it's as soon as itching. I said that, I realized that. Yeah, it's yeah. itching to do this thing. But. Maybe, maybe, but we really want to. I really want to see this concretely. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that's the right example to use, but I think it might be a good example to use. I'm trying to uh, remember what it was. Can you remind me what it was? What do you do with the golden field to get to this feeling? Well, it, 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 it was more. It was more. You know, the, the golden field is like a very important part of the fifth roots of unity. It's like the real part of the fifth roots of unity. Uh, the real part of the yeah yeah. The but fifth, how are you going to the real part of the fifth cyclotomic field? And um, so you know that. The algebraic integers in the fifth cyclotomic field sound like exactly like the kind of thing that would make a beautiful period lattice for an obedience surface. Because the fifth, you know, the fifth cyclotomic field is four dimensional over the rationals. It's just got, you know, five minus one is four primitive fifth roots of unity. Fifth cyclotomic field is four dimensional over the rationals. <laughs> the four generators you can take to be i think yeah i think it's going to, to be the four primitive 
fifth roots of unity. That's what I think, if I didn't screw up. I mean, sometimes there are extra funny algebraic integers that you weren't expecting showing up as unwelcome guests. But um, okay. I think in this case, uh -huh. it's just the lattice generated by those four things. And, and basically, well, let's see. Now, again, now I'm trying to remember, you know, in that dimension, we already have some constraint, right? Some non-trivial constraint on which lattices can be period lattices of uh, abelian varieties. And right, I, and I think I was yeah. trying to work that through and make sure that we did satisfy that constraint in, you know, some symplectic thing or something like that. Boy, I really need to, Really okay. understand all that stuff, but um, but yeah, trying trying to trying to understand that you know that lattice, check that it really is the right kind of lattice that can give us an abelian surface. Check that it gives us generic. Check whether it gives us generic non neuron severity. It seems like it. Yeah, I, I think I really had some argument saying that it really had to give generic neuron severity. But, but 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 the details really need to be checked, and um, uh -huh. okay, you yeah, know, I can, can, but there's there's a million side digressions that this example connects with. Like I I still vaguely suspect that it has all sorts of uh, mystical connections to Penrose's kites and darts stuff and something like that. Yes, yeah, I think so too. Probably it's all very. Dusty, and that's that. That technique for getting fractal tilings comes from like taking that's lattice lattices yeah. in higher dimensions and like slicing them. Right, so, right, so. right, right. So anyway, right. we may indeed get into all that. Right, right, so. right, right. I really want to understand that stuff. It's really so. Uh, so I'm glad I did at least succeed in getting you to sympathize with my problem here. So um, we have uh, like a half an hour left. Um, I want to give you like a mini rant. Okay. Well, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I mean, there's so there's you know there's so many things that right. If we hadn't say spent so much time on this part, there's so many other things we could talk about today about motives. You want to give a mini rant about? I think you, you about you, motives. Yeah, but but I, I think you previewed the the idea that you want to tell something about the coefficient field or something like that. Yeah. Can, can I just tell you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, come on. You always have to do a rant before I can rant. Something. Is that is that the way it always does? Uh, or do I like try? Well, you know, you know, you're no, it's not always. No, no. I'm thinking back. I'm always in like the general 20 year. I mean, the key position, right, is the guy who does the summing up. So I just want to say something, and this is not from me, this is from Todd. Todd pointed out something very interesting. Okay, about this. okay. So this should just take a minute, but of course, okay, I take sure. some more. But um, so but it's, it's a very interesting contrast to what you're suggesting about the coding. But so Todd and me, I, you know, I was struggling to explain to Todd all the things you've been explaining to me. And um, we were struggling to understand adequate equivalence relations on algebraic cycles. What is even an algebraic cycle and um, adequate equivalence relations on them. And there's like, some special case of understanding how the adequate equivalence relations work. And it involves thinking of a divisor as a special case of a um, algebraic cycle. And at this point, Todd pointed out something very interesting, which is that already when you start trying to claim that a divisor is an al a special case of an algebraic cycle, that sort of forces you, right? Divisors, you can't tell divisors what kind of coefficients they should have. You know, divisors already have a specific kind of coefficients, which is integer coefficients. I think. Uh -huh. So it sort of seems yeah. right. It sort of seems like, from that point of view, it sort of seems like the coefficients want to be integers. Whereas, right? So this is this is just this is just an observation that that, mm -hmm. that Todd forced me into, which that viewpoint makes makes me feel like you know oh the sort of vanilla sensible thing would be to have the coefficients be integers whereas you've been telling me on the one hand that you know the 
vanilla thing is for the coffee just to be rationalized or something like that. And, you know, sometimes it's just a fine line between integers and rationals. So maybe that will make sense. But anyway, that was my rant. Okay. But the point is that you're now about to give a sort of a counter rant going in a slightly different direction where you're gonna tell me about something that happens yeah. when we go in some other different direction. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. So let's so, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> so first I need to respond to that rant. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. So this is a true counter rant. So, sure, sure. Um, so a whole bunch of results about motives are known conditional on the Tate conjecture. And I don't know enough about the Tate conjecture, but I know that it's supposed to be like a finite field analog of the Hodge conjecture. Yeah, so you did tell me that. I got that from you, yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. and one thing that's interesting about the Hodge conjecture is that the original Hodge conjecture was proved false. Right, So right. the original Hodge conjecture was- I mean, about, I, I, again, I just have vague cultural knowledge yeah, I don't really understand how it was proved yeah. false with some example, but yeah, uh, but yeah, that I, was I, I think it's on my list of things to do to see and understand yeah. the examples, yeah. the context. But that, but go ahead. Right. But that was claiming, yeah, right, that any integral, any integral element of the cohomology that's sort of in the middle column of the Hodge diamond is of an algebraic variety is realizable by an algebraic cycle. And so- Ah, okay, so, okay, so, so go so ahead, yeah. If, so if that, if that stronger Hodge conjecture were true, it's possible that people would have like, wanted to do a lot of stuff with, uh, with algebraic cycles with integer coefficients, uh -huh. but, but it was proved False, and so then people retreated to working, to hoping that it was still true rationally. Well, that's very so I don't. So I'm not sure how much of that is like the motivation for why people are working rationally. Uh -huh. It's like they're trying to like do it the best they can and still have it be true. Still uh -huh. have their conjectures that they need have a chance to be true. But that would be like my big guess. So can I give a quick counter counter man? Or is it, I, I, I don't yeah, know where sure. the counter is. It up, is up to counter counter counter. <laughs> I mean, this is a, a counter counter rant, except maybe it's maybe it's more like trying to sneak in something that I forgot to say before, which was that, you know, I started, you know, it, because of all this stuff about thinking about possible choices of what the coefficient field could be. I started thinking about what happens if you have torsion in the coefficient uh. field. And when I started thinking about that, it got pretty strange because like I say, with, with you know, Todd's example of the divisors, you know, if you start talking about giving, if you start, start talking about thinking about divisors, but giving the co their coefficients some torsion in that, in a way that's very strange, but, right? There's, from what I understand, there's not really any way to, to like categorify that kind of torsion. Cause it's kind of like saying that, what am I trying to say? It'd be like say, right? I mean, I have this idea that line bundles, that this, right? There's this analogy that goes, algebraic geometry is a dimensional analysis of line bundles are to dimensions. And from that point of view, it's like, right? It's like saying that if you, if, if you start tinkering with the coefficients of the line bundles, like from Toby Bartles used to talk about when I when I told him about this stuff, he used to say that you know people who seriously think about dimensional analysis in physics, they often make the dimensions into, you know, they, they often do include, you know, the the square root of a dimension as a possible dimension and things like uh -huh, that. Uh -huh. And so you know, or, or, but then I was also imagining right, you could you could tinker with it, you try to put make the you could try to work in a context where the square of every dimension was trivial or something like uh -huh, that. Uh -huh. uh, but when I thought about trying to categorify that, it, it, it didn't really seem consistent. It seemed like to be getting me, me into all sorts of trouble. So I'm very leery of the idea of giving the coefficients of divisors some sort of exotic field. 
uh -huh. uh, where they live. Um, maybe particularly the torsion seems very exotic and inconsistent. But anyway, I'm very leery of that. But but so what? I might be wrong. But anyway, okay. But but now but now I think it's it's back to you, right? And you're supposed to yeah tell us stuff. Okay. Okay. Oh, so yeah. So I was talking about numerical pure motives. And then you still have a choice of coefficient field. And right. I had been not completely benounced to myself. I'd been talking about them with co rational coefficients. Right. And then Milne says that in that case, the simple motives have a pretty nice description. Yes. But still slightly complicated description. So so they are these. Um, do we call them simple or do we call them irreducible? It makes no difference except culturally, I guess. But I think people call say simple. Okay. Um, so, except that I that prevented me from saying they have a simple description. So that's the bad thing about. Sure, that. sure. Um, so, so they were these. Uh, so, so, so they will. The description relies on this concept of a vague Q number, which let me recall for myself what it is. So, a vague Q number is an algebraic integer. Sorry, sorry, it's a uh, it's a number that has it's, it's rather long and tiresome. So, it's a number whose absolute value is q to the n over two for some n and all of its Galois conjugates have the same absolute value. Yes. And if you multiply it by high enough power of q, it becomes an algebraic integer. Okay. So that's pretty long already, but anyway, so the so the simple objects are. But in principle, I could always reconstruct that by just reading some textbook description of the vague conjectures and seeing what where the zeros are supposed to lie, and that should give me a definition of what a vague Q number is. If if if, if you understand, oh. if you have a, if you have a superficial understanding of the vague conjectures, then you should be able to always reconstruct the definition of a vague Q number from that. No, um, not quite, because you, what you would get. Yeah. From that would yeah. be the the so-called effective motives, uh, which are the so. The, oh, so okay. The, okay, fair so, enough. Yeah. So what you'd get then, if you just like read it off from that, is you'd get something less complicated. You, you would get you would get just things that are algebraic integers, and they and all their Galois conjugates have absolute value the same. And it's Q to the N over two for some N. Okay, but that's still probably very helpful in terms yeah, of- Yeah, that's extremely helpful. I mean, that's yeah. in a way, in a lot of ways, that's sort of better. Yeah, than, yes, uh, yes. So the, yeah. Okay, but, but, the, but in either case, the simple motives or simple effective motives are not these numbers, they're, they're, they're Galois orbits of these numbers, Galois equivalence classes of these numbers. Again, I like, um, to, I like to try to think of that as just thinking of them as being these monic polynomials, monic irreducible polynomials that have those. Yeah, that's probably really good to do. Okay. Um, so, well, I could say a bunch about that, but, I, but what I, but then it turns out yeah. that if you switch your coefficients from rationals to some algebraic extension of the rationals, yes. then it tends to, as you might expect, it tends to wash out the difference between simple motives. I mean, well, I would say, as you expect, maybe you should think of motives as sort of aiming towards being a lot like group representations. In fact, they're, I mean, the, 
whole point of this Tanakian category baloney is that they ultimately there are representations of this group. Yeah. And so you know that like when you work with classifying group representations, representations that can be different rationally can get to be the same uh, working over. Well, okay, that's expression. very interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so there's a story about how that works, but the story is takes a especially simple form when you go all the way and, and you just work with the algebraic closure of the rationals as your yes. coefficient field. And so then, and so then it turns out that just the simple uh, motives over then they just become the vile Q, vague Q numbers themselves. Yeah, none of this equivalence class baloney. None of the conscious. Yeah. So, so the reason why we had this conjugacy stuff was that the, uh -huh. the Galois group was like the Galois group of Q bar over Q. And now we're doing, <laughs> it's sort of like now our group has turned to the Galois group of Q bar over Q bar, which is trivial. And so there's not, none, of, none of this uh, orbit stuff going on at all. Sorry, I'm trying to use my, uh, I can't remember that name that it's like a Japanese person's name when you're studying complex representations of some group but then you consider real forms of the group and you have real representations you said and this name for a type of diet sataki sataki diagram. I'm trying to use my sataki diagram intuition I'm trying to apply that to the situation you're describing because there's also a generalized Sataki diagram that works not just for the reals versus for the complex, but for any field versus. Ah, ah, cool. Um, and um, so that's one of the ways. I'm not sure that's the right way to react to what you're describing, but I'm just trying to see if I can get that to match up somehow. The way you know, the way. Sataki yeah, I mean, I think yeah, yeah, I think there the, would be like some. Uh, yeah. There'd be some algebraic extension of the rationals such that, like, if you worked with those as coefficients, the only two vague Q numbers you'd have to consider the same as like some number and it's complex conjugate. So that'd be like sort of like going from R to C. There's like some <laughs> is there some name of like the maximal real algebraic extension of the rationals it's like all you need to do now is throw an i and then you've got everything does that make sense maximal real algebraic mm. extension of the rationals yeah 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 i'm sure, yeah, yeah. sure there's something like that so anyway you could um but anyway yeah so i wanted to say something about like this simplified world and the most important thing to say about this simplified world is that in this case if you tensor two simple objects, you're just multiplying the, these vague Q numbers. Yeah. So this, and, and that means that like the tensor product of two simple things is simple again. And so, well, and so you can sort of begin to suspect that now in this world, the motivic Galois group is gonna be abelian. So it's like these. That's very interesting. These motives are like yeah. all one, yeah. one dimensional. Yeah. 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 Well, that's very interesting. And so it's just a puzzle to like figure out what kind of abelian group, or maybe abelian group. Yeah, what kind of abelian group has its representations correspond exactly to these? Uh, the Q numbers, and it's it's not it seems sort of nice because it's sort of like how like representations of the circle group are just integer. Wait, that's that the one I wanted to use? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> representations of the finite dimensional representations of the real line are just like given by the real numbers, the Fourier transform kind of thing. And yeah. 
yeah, tensoring them is just multiplying the real numbers. So it's sort of like that, but it's sort of like you can use complex numbers, but they gotta be, they gotta have these nice algebraic properties. So I, I wanna, I don't understand it very well yet, but it just seems like a nice picture. I wanna try to like find the simplest world of motives to, yes, to get to understand them. Yes, yes. So are you, is that, that's I mean, it. That's, that's, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's fine, uh, that's fine. Um, yeah, so, okay, so we're getting close to finishing here. Um, so, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other things to say, but, you know, we, 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 we don't, we, we ran out of time here. I'm, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, unfortunately, next time, yeah, you sort of should both talk about all these categories you were trying to come up with to help understand motives, and ideally, if you if we make progress, talk about this golden abelian variety stuff. Yes, yes, but uh, there's so many other things. I mean, uh, <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> you've, been, uh, you've been you've uh, been. T telling me this stuff that Milne talks about. There's this stuff, like I say, I stumbled across this stuff that Eve Andre or somebody uh -huh. talks about, and it gives some very interesting perspectives on motives. That yeah, I'll um, have to read. I'll have to read that. That um, that really seem to you know connect to things you're talking about in very interesting ways. I'm not sure if anything can tell us to say about that yet, but maybe I should just check my notes here. To see if there's anything I should say before we quit. It, maybe not. Maybe we should, maybe this is getting close to a good time to quit here. Um, let me. Uh, well. Okay, so yeah, maybe I don't really have too much intelligence to say, but maybe there's one thing that I could sort of ask for about the, that, that I would like us to do at some point pretty soon. And that is, I would like to look at really explicit examples of, um, of item potents that we can split uh, in the effective motive world. So um, I, I have, well, so one of, one of the ideas that I have in mind here is, am I saying this right? So, so I mean, these morphisms of effective motives are some sort of correspondences meaning some sort of algebraic cycles in, a, in or on a Cartesian product, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if we're going to talk about them being idempotent, then we want them to be endo correspondences, right? So that, so that they can be, right, if they, right, I, 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 for idempotent to parse, we should have an endo correspondence. And once you have an endo correspondence, Correspondence. You could ask for the endo correspondence to be a symmetric endo correspondence, and that actually uh -huh. seems sort of interesting. Um, so I guess I'm wondering if uh, you know, are there interesting symmetric? Are there interesting idempotent symmetric endo correspondences? Which, right? So that would. So I, can I answer the question? Yeah. yeah go ahead. I mean, well, just like some really crucial endo correspondences. That nobody even knows if they exist, but they're like incredibly important. <laughs> is yeah. is the ones that would that would implement that would have the effect of mapping the cohomology down to a specific uh, degree. <laughs> so so correspondences map. You can think of them as like giving maps of from the cohomology of the one variety over to the cohomology of the other, right? Are you sort of- As familiar? inducing, uh, what was it? So, I'm sorry, is giving maps? They, they, an endo, an endo, 
a correspondence gives a, ma a map from the cohomology of the source variety to the target variety. That's, or may, I hope I have the direction correct, but I think- I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure I've been thinking about it that way. Have you told me to think about it that way? Or is it just obvious that I'm supposed to think about it that way? It almost makes sense. Um, one of, it's not supposed to be ultra obvious, but yeah. one of the things in adequate uh, equivalence relations is that gives you a cohomology it, the equivalence classes of your uh, algebraic cycles give you a cohomology where you can pull back but also push forward along uh maybe i understand what you're saying let's see let's see let's see i wasn't thinking of it the way you're describing but i guess this is a big part of the yoga of motive so it's good to think about okay and then so, this, yeah. so then you get to ask like oh so if i have some like operation on cohomology yeah not not like a cohomology operation but like if i have like a map if i have some like way of defining an endo map on the cohomology of a variety yeah just like as a vector space endo map um can i realize it with a correspondence can i get it from a correspondence yeah and and so one so one of the standard conjectures says that these endo maps where you take the cohomology and you just kill off everything except the cohomology in one particular degree is given by a correspondence let me see if i understand that again say it again there's i'm not sure i understand yet what you mean by a map that's giving off by killing off everything except for something in one degree. So, okay, so what are you saying? So you've got like two varieties, two projective varieties. I'm okay. doing an endo map now. Okay, you have one projective variety. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, okay, so that's what you're saying. So like actually, so like theoretically, like for any point in the Hodge diamond, you could hope. I, I forget how crazy these some of these hopes would be, but for you could hope that like for any point in the Hodge diamond, yeah, there'd be an endo correspondence that would whose effect on the cohomology would be to map would be to be zero except on that one entry in the diamond and then one on that one entry. I'm really gonna think about that some more. <laughs> so anyway, I was just saying that, yeah. this, that this one of like squashing it down to a particular row of the Hodge diamond, I, that feels, it just feels to me like that that will be a symmetric uh, correspondence. If it, but but the interesting thing is that that's like a standard conjecture that there even exists such a thing. People don't know how to get it. But anyway, you may have had like less. Did you have like ideas of ones that you actually could should thought existed? <laughs> yes, yes. But also, okay. But another comment here is, I'm not sure I can get this to work. I, I want to sort of claim that, you know, there's so much useful hints you're giving in the discussion here. You know, that it would be great if I could use the use this recording as my notes instead of having to take notes. So that would be like more impetus for you to keep the recordings updated so I can check my okay. notes. Easier. Yeah, the only thing that slows me down is that I've been trying to like write up a description uh -huh. of them. Well, That's like this. So yeah, but you can, you can, you can, you can, I think you can procrastinate on that. Uh, yeah, that's true. On writing the descri description instead of procrastinating on. Okay. Yeah, I have some that are <laughs> I have some that are ready to go, except for that. Okay. And but what else was I going to say? Oh, yes, I do have something I think much more simple minded. What I have in mind is this: What if I just have? Sorry. What if I just take a sub variety of a variety? So l l let's say I have a variety. Projective variety X. Now let's say I have a sub variety S. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So S includes into X. And then the diagonal of X takes X 
a sub variety of x squared. So that also makes s, right? So I, I compose, I compose the inclusion s into x with the diagonal of x. And that's giving me a symmetric correspondence. Now, I, I, didn't check, I didn't check yet whether this, we haven't checked yet whether this correspondence satisfies that condition about you know, the dimension matching or something like that. But so in order you can ask for which sub varieties S does this symmetric correspondence qualify as, you know, these correspondences that, that, that you use to get to get the, the, the morphisms. And I was Is trying to yeah. sub variety of X or of X times X. It's a rigorous sub variety of X. Uh -huh. And, but then it becomes a sub variety of X squared by, yeah. by, by the diagonal. Yeah. So I think it won't satisfy this dimension condition that's. Well, in some very, in some very restricted case, it should still satisfy the. Yeah. You think um, it's so. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. But, uh, but I wanted to say that, like, people also think about it a graded ring of correspondences where they, a graded thing of a graded category of correspondences where they uh, drop that dimension condition. Okay, that's very interesting, that's very interesting. So, so you only, so the, that, that dimension condition is like for when you're just trying to define motives, you just like focus on this one thing, but apparently people who know what they're doing are also interested in the more general thing. So, so I'm just saying like, even if it doesn't obey the dimension condition, it still could be like an interesting thing. Okay, okay. And, and then just sort of along the same lines, roughly the same lines, a very naive question is, I'm for obvious reasons tempted to take very natural correspondences like incidence relations between, you know, uh, lines. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, or incidence relations between points and lines, a point lies on a line. That gives you a, a sort of correspondence, but you have, I, I, I didn't think too much about whether any correspondences of that flavor, to what extent they could qualify, either satisfying the, that dimensional constraint, or as you were just suggesting, going beyond that uh, uh -huh. dimensional constraint. Uh, but I think you can, you can see why I'd be interested in examples like that to see to what extent they fit into this game. Yeah, I think if you just drop that dimension constraint, all those kind of incidence relations that we used to know and, and love are really cool. And I, and I should say that like all of those, they do give you like maps on cohomology. And so people, I think, I think people do look at like a, maps on cohomology. So like point line incidence relations should give you like a map from the cohomology of one Grassmannian to the cohomology of the, like the cohomology of the point Grassmannian to the cohomology of the line Grassmannian. And I, we've probably like almost bumped into those kind of maps because we were like thinking about cohomologies of Grassmannians. Yeah, but I'm gonna really have to think about this stuff. So, I mean, there is some theme going on here of representing cohomology co classes by algebraic cycles. And um, I mean, that also just reminds me of people like, uh, people out, I think outside of algebraic geometry, like uh, Nils Bass, is that his name? Uh -huh. um, I mean, he was always thinking about that kind of stuff. Right. In submanifolds. Or mapped in manifolds. Yes, but I was always thinking about it in what to me seemed like much more ambitious <laughs> settings than just mere algebraic geometry. Or something. Uh, okay. um, anyway, uh, running out of things to say here, uh, and we're running out of time about the same time too. I mean, I'm not really running out of things to say. <laughs> running out of things to say unless we uh, have to quit, which we should. Um, so, anything else we should do before we quit here? Nope. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, we did good stuff today, but, but there's so much other stuff that uh, we didn't quite get around to because of there's just being too much yeah. stuff to get around yeah. to.
Yeah, I would be perfectly happy, for example, if you picked either uh, yeah. talking about categories related to motives speculatively or this their own severity problem and golden abelian varieties and like pick one and say okay we're going to talk about that one and then i could have a little time to think about that one and we could like email a bit about that one and then we could, like, uh, yeah yeah okay okay because okay. i so, think doing both is sort of sure not gonna work as well at once that is <laughs> yeah i mean sometimes it does like today we did both and sort of worked okay yeah but, that's true. um but that's true. uh yeah no i mean if we yeah i mean if we run but i agree if we try to coordinate beforehand that helps the, the only thing is that the this bit you know as you're saying this thing about categories and toposes and connecting that to motives I was talking about that stuff. I'm still thinking about that stuff. But the more I think about it, the more it starts to connect with this stuff that I've been reading about from Andre. So that might morph more into the direction of things about some of the stuff that Andre has been saying. But well, again, we'll still try to coordinate it by email so that, you know, try to start planning earlier than like Monday morning or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this was very helpful. Thanks a lot. Yep. Okay. Great. See you. Okay. I'll see you. Bye. Yep.